What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Kind of Funny Games Cast. I'm one of your hosts, Greg Miller, alongside the OK Beast Blessing, Eddie Oye Jr. What's up, Greg? Well, I was hoping you would change the red shirt. You know, on Games Daily, oh, when man. we complimented you on it, we said you look <laughs> too good in the red shirt. I got too many compliments. Like, I, I I couldn't do it because, like, when you – so right before this, actually, we got the call from Kevin to join the Discord call. Sure. And I didn't join immediately because I wasn't wearing the red sweater. And oh, so yes. I, legit, I was like, okay, I'm going to answer the call, but they're going to have to wait for, like, a minute before this, <laughs> right, so I can actually tr uh, put this thing on. And so – I'm glad to see the power this, of this looking has gone to your head. You're oh, a yeah. diva about it. This is me permanently. All right, fine. Uh, the former and former Imran Khan. How are you, Imran? I'm doing good. I noticed that like the sacred symbols behind Blessing are mm -hmm. lit up completely. Yeah, I've never seen them all lit up, so I assume it's because he's wearing the red shirt. They're lighting up in response to that. Sure. Oh yeah, yeah. that's yeah. exactly it's it's that's exactly the reason. It's not because uh, Greg and Bear are making fun of the the fact that they've been uh, like <laughs> intermittently lit up, not all lit up at the same time. Do you I like them all lit up, Imran? Do you like them all? Imran, lit up? What, what is your opinion? It's hard to make out what they are all lit up. Like on camera, it's a little difficult. Saying. Yeah. Fine, then my, get back up point. and go do it. Go ahead and go <laughs> do it and alternate in between one and one. You know what I mean? What Gosh. What are the sacred symbols? They're the PlayStation buttons back there. So you got oh, your man, cross, your circle, it. your square, triangle. Well, okay, I understand. Nate Fox, Sucker Punch creative director on <laughs> Ghost of Tsushima. How are you? Uh, I'm very well, thank you. I'm just really interested in all of your decor. So it's going to take me a little while to soak it all in well it's lucky for you that for blessing the decor is pretty much just the sacred symbols back there yeah and the backpack and a butterfinger plush of cloud yeah the backpack's the killer that's <laughs> what pulls the room together <laughs> you can't have it without that nate I, my eye goes right to it yeah yeah exactly exactly Thank you. i appreciate it i hate you <laughs> if you didn't know ladies and gentlemen this is the kind of funny games cast each and every week we come together to talk about the video games we love uh today is a very very special episode of course nate is here from sucker punch we are doing our ghost of tsushima spoiler cast that means in just a little bit i'm gonna say listen gloves are off we can spoil everything and that means if you haven't beaten the game yet you should turn off this podcast and go play the game and then come back don't worry this podcast is not like a loaf of bread it, it will age well you don't have to worry about it. We're going the, the the hot takes, the opinions, the information's going moldy. You can go take your time with Ghost. Come to us when you're ready. But that is the deal. Uh, of course, this is the Kind of Funny Games cast. You can get it each and every week over on patreon.com slash kind of funny games where you can get it ad free. You can get it with an exclusive post show and you can write in like so many of you did for this spoiler cast. Uh, remember, if you have no bucks to toss our way, it's no big deal. You can head over to youtube.com slash kind of funny games and Rooster Teeth and podcast services around the globe each and every week to get a brand new episode that has ads, no post show. That's why we say to go to Patreon. You don't like it. Too bad. <laughs> Housekeeping for you. We've launched a new podcast. You can get the Kind of Funny X cast right now on YouTube.com slash Kind of Funny Games and Podcast Services. Thank you to our Patreon producers, James Hastings, Sancho West, Julian the Gluten-Free Gamer, Delaney Twinning, Jeffrey P. Long, Jesus Barrio, a.k.a. Bent Fork PR, Skin Tight Salmon, Game Jumper X, and Mohammed Mohammed, a.k.a. Momo. Today, we are brought to you by ExpressVPN and Purple Mattress, but I'll tell you about that later. For now, let us begin the Ghost of Tsushima spoiler cast. This is your chance. Get out now. Pause the podcast if you haven't beaten Ghost of Tsushima yet. Okay. it's Now it's go time. Nate, you motherfucker killing that horse. <laughs> oh I swear God. to God, dude. I, I When Nobu got shot a bunch with the arrows, I was like, oh, that sucks. And Wait, then when we nope. start kept going and he kept limping and go, like, oh my god, they're don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, and you did it. So first of all, you you said Nobu. Mine was yeah. Kage. That's what what about you? the new blessing? My second Mine, one was Kage. I, I had I had Sora, and this it, so this is a whole interesting experience because you I remember March loving. Go ahead. <laughs> well, actually, actually, <laughs> hell yeah, yeah, it was Sora because I ch I then changed to Kage. But uh, Kevin, who's also playing the game, it's part of kind of funny. Um, was hanging out at my place. And I was playing. Um, I was playing Ghost as he was sitting at my place, setting up my, my new lap, my new uh, PC that I'm rocking with. And I was playing with Kage, who was my second horse. And Kevin mm. was like, "Oh, you went with the you went with the black horse named Kage." And I was like, "Uh, yeah," because I realized Kevin hadn't made it that far yet. So I was like, "I, was like, I yeah, sure did. I, I sure did." did. <laughs> yeah, Nate. When when does that? kind of decision happen like I, I i obviously i want to talk about the entire journey of creating this game moving from yeah. you know infamous to this but 
for something like that, that we were, I think we were talking about this earlier on the review too, or maybe it was PS. I love you, but playing that game and being like, okay, yeah, I'm into the story and this is great, blah, blah, blah. But it's, it, you know, it's not like uh, a last of us where it's going to make me cry or do anything that like, I tell the story of after no, I buried Nobu, Jen came out of, of her office and was just like, all right, so yeah, this just happened and blah, 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 blah. And she looked at me, she's like, what's wrong? And I'm like, baby, they killed the horse. <laughs> and she immediately went, they killed Nobu? <laughs> and I was like, how do you know the name? She's like, I don't know any of the characters' names in this game. But if I <laughs> there's an animal in this game, I know the animal's name. I know Nobu. And she's like, immediately, he was just like Porty. I'm like, as soon as the horse died in the game, I caressed Porty. I started petting Porty. Like, when do you decide you're going to fuck up our feelings like that? Uh, well, you know, it kind of takes a while to build a relationship with somebody so that when mm -hmm. you, you hurt them like that, it <laughs> gets a response. And who's better, more faithful, more of a friend than your horse who will show up when you're getting chased by Mongols? And um, it seemed like the right thing to do to show oh, okay. that Jin was at his absolute lowest as he got ditched by his uncle and he was on his own and what would be worse than that losing your best friend so it was to put him in that absolute darkest portion of the night so that he could come out of it the other side did you guys and i know that obviously as we're recording this streams are just starting to happen the game's just getting out into the public's hand i know i've talked to other reviewers people have seen that i don't know if you've had conversations with that in play testing, in your own office, in the little bit you've seen, did you expect it to be as impactful as, it, as I think it was, as we think it is? I definitely think that anytime you uh, particularly wound an animal, it's really impactful emotionally. Mm. It's super weird that in video games, killing humans, you, you have no emotional reaction to it by and large. You're so conditioned to it in modern video sure. games. But... Um, animals it's a different story altogether and so when we decided that we would uh kill your horse who you named and you picked so that you have some level of uh, kind of ownership over that animal sure. who's been really your best friend uh we did it so that you would have that reaction that's why at the end of most missions you see him sleeping on his horse or yeah. petting it interacting with it just to create that bond yeah, well, that's what it, I thought was. Happened oh, sorry, go Imran. Shortly after Taka died, I was like, "Oh no, Taka died." I was like, that, "That's sad." But then the horse died. I was like, "Oh, mm, why did the I horse die?" The horse got more like more of like an, an emotional scene. I feel like than even Taka did. Like Taka, of course, had the had the whole mission right that went down, and and the way Taka went. Oh, we, we're gonna have to talk about that soon because that that was kind of a heartbreaker <laughs> for me. But when it was the horse, that's when I, I started getting flashbacks of Shadow of Colossus. Actually, spoilers for Shadow of Colossus. Also, did you guys have <laughs> have any like inspiration from that, or was there any like thought of, oh yeah, like we've we've had this in games before, uh, but is there is there a way we could actually further this and, and make it unique to Ghost? It was very much just us trying to look at who Jin had a really powerful relationship with and it it's the horse i mean i really like the character of taka and taka's death is definitely a turning point when jin just turns up the gas and says i'm going to do whatever it takes to yeah. to drive these mongols out but the horse is i think more personal just because the horse doesn't talk to other characters it doesn't have some relationship with unit it's just your pal your pet your friend and so when it passes it's 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 a much more quiet and much more um, intimate mm -hmm. moment. Yeah, and I think one of the things that stood out to me afterwards and reflecting on it is what you already talked about, but I think you guys do it so well of building that relationship but never beating us over the head with it where it's you know a gameplay element obviously of you know calling for your horse getting on your horse going uh but then like you're saying of coming out of a mission and being sleeping on it or you know when he like noses you while you're like sitting there posing and he, he like bumps you and you're like all right calm down or whatever we saw this like non-verbal friendship continue and grow and then even while i'd be on missions right it would be conversations with them of just like oh you're a good horse and you know one day we'll go for a quiet ride and there were all these you know it, Jin was able to express himself without ever having to have a scene with you know uh, yuna or whoever was just like oh i love my horse and he's so good and i'd be lost without him and yada 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 <laughs> it was just like you did such a great job of building that relationship one thing that was a bit of a challenge making the game was that the main character 
is a samurai and he needed to be kind of a rule following samurai at the beginning mm. of the game, which meant pretty stoic, right? And the guy we hired, uh, grown up in Japan, and he he's he keeps it pretty straight laced for the first, you know, half of the game. And that makes it a little harder to get in and understand um, him emotionally because he's so stoic. But the one like clear way he always could kind of break through that was when he was being really kind to uh, animals, in particular his horse, because he didn't need to be strong for anyone. He was just talking to his friend, the horse, who's an animal. And uh, that's something we, we kind of pushed on because it gives uh, a little light into Jin Sakai as a, as a, in his relaxed state when no one's looking, when he can just mm. be himself. I actually kind of ended up resenting the transitionary horse between... Uh, the first horse and the second, because like Jin wasn't saying those like nice things, so I kind of it fed back to me of like, no, fuck this horse. This isn't my horse. <laughs> Wait, Plus, so it was all did, scrawny when, and like did back, you, weird back legs. <laughs> did you pick the scrawny horse when you? Because you could have chosen to stay with the broken Charlie Brown Christmas tree horse. Wait, you hell no. Good. Good. Yeah, I didn't realize oh, yeah. that. Oh yeah, I actually I assume a lot of people are going to be like, well, it's broken down and it's ugly, but it's my ugly. <laughs> no, I went for I went for a white, big white stallion as soon as I could. <laughs> yeah, me too. When that option yeah. popped up, that's where I went. I had started with all black Nobu, and then yeah, I went to mm -hmm. all white on the second time with uh, Kage. Well, I try to make kind of like almost a um, a narrative parallel decision to where because I started off with Sora, who was the white horse, um, and when it came to that, when it came down to that decision, I kind of thought about it in the way of okay, well, Jin is going from samurai to the ghost, right? He's going from like this this honorable warrior to now becoming this essentially batman kind of kind of thing Damn and so i was like you know what man i'm gonna pick the black horse and i'm gonna call it kage for shadow because i feel like this represents where i'm at right now uh which i thought was like a really cool thing uh in terms of the choice you're giving there as a player to kind of dictate what your future is going to be i made the opposite choice but for the same reasons of for me i knew i was going to become the ghost at some point so i was like okay i'll choose a black horse named kage like a a very ninja like thing at first because it's kind of like a you know, obviously the metaphor is yin yang for me. And then once Kage died, I had to choose another horse. It's like, okay, well, I want to hold on to a bit of the old Shimura Sakai Jin. So I'm going to choose a white horse named uh, Nobu because it seemed more samurai to me. Sure. And uh, yeah, that I think we're starting to play around with one of the themes we've talked a lot about in both the review and then PS I Love You, right? Of this Jin's journey of going from samurai to being ghost and how. I don't, I don't know how much you've, I, you know, you said you watched some of the review, if not all of it. And then I was talking on PS. I love you, Nate. Like I was so impressed when it was all said and done that uh, being a big sucker punch fan, being a huge infamous fan, right? Like I'm used to making the choice of, is this my good or bad playthrough? And then going that way. And for you guys to eliminate the morality system of it, but ha still play with the idea of it where we started and Jin was very, and his uncle were very upfront about what samurais were and that, you know, you address it head on. And like, you know, when, uh, you know, originally is like, Oh, we should do thief things. And you're like, no, no way, whatever. I played the game that way and felt guilty when I would do the ghost like things until the moment we're talking about, right. Where it is gloves off. Uh, I am the ghost. You know I mean? When I told uncle that I am the ghost, that's what's happening. Like from there on out, I, that's when I immediately, dyed all my clothes black and i'm like i'm stealthing <laughs> everything from here on out and like i don't even need standoffs i thought that was so impressive that you did all that without again beating me over the head with it or making it uh, a gameplay uh you know, well you should play this way because you'd get this you know better gear weapons whatever like if we're talking about infamous and you know doubling down on those choices and building that character is that something you were consciously doing or is that something that we're reading into it knowing your past work? Well, the transition of Jin struggling to go away from his code, go away from the man he always thought he would be to become the ghost for the greater good, right? To save his home and the people he loves. That's the narrative spine of the story. And one of the things that we tried to do that is a little bit different than we've done in the past is um, have the player participate in that transformation by upgrading and choosing uh, abilities that allow them to become more and more of that ghost-like character. As you go through the 
upgrade tree and as you get new abilities Jin becomes more capable of terrifying enemies he becomes more um, capable of moving smoothly where Mongols can't see him and just assassinating them and the enemies get to be such a big number that it really is pretty it, it, it's the way to go and so <laughs> the player is is participating they're they're interactively doing the same thing that Jin is so yeah it was it was absolutely on purpose we wanted you to experience Jin's transformation not just get told about it mm -hmm. and so reading reviews you know and hearing crit criticism so far of it right like I've seen some people talk about how oh well it's got a slow start and I personally didn't feel that way I was along for the ride but were you ready for that did you understand that again the title is the ghost of Tsushima right and even when I was reviewing it and I was mentioning like oh there's this moment where what's the name of the game you become the ghost, like right you have to embrace that identity yeah. at some point did you think there'd be a push and pull between people who wanted to play it just as a samurai people who didn't understand they were going on this journey or wouldn't see it to that part? Well, I mean, the, the beginning in a game as big and as complex as Ghost of Tsushima, there's a lot that people need to come to grips with. And there's the narrative setup. There's the different kind of ways in which you fight and the fighting's not crazy simple. And no. <laughs> uh, kind of understanding uh, how you move around the world. So I think in that first day of play, people are just figuring out how they can interact with the world. And that can be, you know, quite a lot to take in given the scope of the game. And then once you get your feet underneath you, uh, who doesn't want to be a samurai, right? That's the, to me, that's the major appeal of the game. Being a samurai in the open world is the X factor for me that, that, drove myself and so many other sucker punchers to want to make this title so yeah i could totally imagine that people get in they're acting as a samurai and they don't instantly want to let go of that to become the ghost it, it takes a little while sure so then talk to me about how this does start let's go way back right because you do infamous uh, uh second son right you do first light uh and both are set in the most familiar territory possible of seattle <laughs> right <laughs> where you guys are you're up there in bellevue you're doing something close to home it's your third infamous game you guys finish that you finish the fetch stuff is there the idea to do uh infamous four is there an idea to do something radically different like where does ghost start where were you guys at when you finished all of the infamous stuff when we finished Infamous, we were just pretty ready to do something new. I mean, we've yeah. been at it for so long. So uh, the company pitched in a lot of ideas and um, working on an open world samurai game was just the most alluring. When we came upon the, uh, the Mongol invasion of Tsushima Island in 1274, it really set up an excellent um, external conflict that it was easy to understand why you wanted to fight, why going around the world was worthwhile. And um, it just, it felt like a, a natural fit with that wandering samurai fantasy. Mitchell what, from Canada. Oh. Oh, you okay, hold you your horses. Go, you All right, you want to hold <laughs> right. your horses? I'll, I'll hoard these Mitchell horses. from Canada deserves the floor. I uh, wrote into <laughs> patreon.com slash kind of funny games and says, I have a question for Nate Brox from Sucker Punch. Where did the idea to take the studio in this bold new direction uh, rather than taking the safe route of a new infamous game come from? Mainly, what made you feel that Jin's story was a story that needed to be told? Did you start with the idea for the story or simply the idea of a samurai game and build around that? Selfishly, I'd also like to know if Sucker Punch has any interest in returning to Infamous in the future or if you're interested in new things. I know that Greg's a fan of those games too, but there's still lots of posts showing up on PlayStation subreddits about the series. <laughs> Thanks for reading my question if you do and have a good day. Mitchell from Canada. So for Mitchell's question, yeah, you talk about you, you uh, the samurai game idea gets tossed out in this company kick around. You look at Tsushima. That's great. Where does Jin fall into it? Like what made you feel that his was the story or how did you get that part of it? So like maybe the next day, you know, we're talking about let's do an open world samurai game. Um, and I've been looking at this history and the invasion and the, the elevator pitch for the story is a samurai 
has to give up his code and become a new type of warrior in order to save his island home from Mongol invaders. So in that sentence, which we had really early, I mean, at the beginning, we knew what the arc was going to be for the hero character. And definitely the samurai fantasy came first, but right next to that was this idea that Jin was going to become something more than just a samurai. He was going to become the ghost. Uh, so that there was this feeling of, of, of personal sacrifice. Blessing at A.U.A. Jr. Yeah, I was, well, was going to ask, like, what was the transition like between creating a world like the infamous games where it does feel more, the world feels more like a playground as opposed to what we have in Ghost of Tsushima, which is more explorable and feels more vast and expansive and feels like something you're uncovering as you're going along as opposed to infamous that feels more like hey we're creating this world so you can have fun as you jump around and beat bad guys and use your abilities and all these things so in infamous we built cities that were jungle gyms they're meant to be climbed and jumped and swung on and you know you can interact with them in all these different ways and for ghost of tsushima we wanted to make a landscape that was a wrapped christmas present you saw something on the hill and you thought, what is that? I'm going to check it out. So it was about rewarding curiosity, unlike building mm. a jungle gym, which was just the physical act of zooming and grinding and doing all these kind of skateboard tricks with your superpowers. Sushima is very, very different. It is uh, a much uh, kind of more contemplative uh, kind of. It's more about looking at the world and feeling what's out there versus just the immediacy of being able to turn on your powers and zip around with dynamic action. What, um, what was the thing that drove that change? Like, why did you guys decide that was the direction you wanted to go? Well, we wanted to make a grounded samurai game in the mold of the classic samurai films that we all really admired. Uh, you know, Seven Samurai being the real heavy hitter as well as Yojimbo. And these are games where people don't, zip around with superpowers, right? They're humans on horses who walk into town and they solve problems with their wits and their sword arm, and that's it. So trying to be true to the source material really is, is huge. In that vein, you kind of mentioned history a little bit. Like, So I ended up reading, before, when I found out I was going to review the game, I ended up reading about the Mongol invasion of Tsushima and all that. The version, the story in the game is fictitious i guess like uh obviously yes, <laughs> but like <laughs> the in the actual history samurai uh the mongols mostly got wiped out by a storm when i finished the game yeah. and it, this may be like my brain just going rushing for interpretation but i was like oh was it just that's what japan told people because they didn't want people to know about jin or was that just like not even a thought in the <laughs> in sucker punch well um because you know what the real history is i bet you saw a lot of what was going on um, mm -hmm. The end of the game, actually, there is a storm, a, a huge wind that comes in that forces all the Mongol boats into a bay that gives Jin this opportunity to slay them all. Mm -hmm. um, on top of that, Jin's kind of uh, spiritual connection to the island is largely referenced by wind, this divine wind. Mm -hmm. That is playing into Kamikaze as well. If you mm -hmm. look at his Saya on the Sakai Steel, there's lightning and storm winds on it as well. This is all referencing the real event that um, took down the Armada. Even though in our fictional story, it is Jin and Shimura and a lot of people risking themselves to destroy the Mongols. If you know the history, you can see the connection. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. That's awesome. That yeah, makes so much really sense, cool. right? The, the real historical things, this uh, storm coming in, and then they on the same night, obviously, you guys, uh, gin strikes or whatever. That makes a lot of sense in terms of history of meeting fiction. So I got to well, cool. I got to actually uh, go for it. Nate, well, it's just talk. an example. Like our, our, <laughs> our, our game is certainly takes uh, inspiration from history, but it is not historically accurate. You know, our version mm -hmm. of Tsushima is not stone for stone, the same place. It's got a lot more diversity and kind of elevation change that is, is very friendly for a video game and very friendly for trying to reproduce a uh, cinematic samurai movie feel. Um, but those kind of nods to what happened in time and what was happening culturally were really important to us for a feeling of authenticity. So the question I was going to throw out there has to do with the ending of the game. 
and like mainly mainly the choice to have the choice you know as Jin of whether you want to go the route of uh slaying your uncle in honor or letting your uncle live that was a choice for me when i got there i was i was shocked that you guys were going that route because you know up to this point it felt like this it felt like you guys were giving us the story you wanted to tell us where once i got there i was like oh this is interesting i wonder how this reflects for possible future games in the franchise if you decide to have a decision that might split you know how what what the ripples are going to be coming forward is that something that you guys thought about at all or was this really a thing where you guys were like hey we want people to to be able to own uh the gin that they're playing in their story well we knew we wanted to tell one story and that was that transformation from samurai to ghost and little bit by little bit Jin is letting go of that old self-concept of who he was going to be even at the expense of his relationship and he loves most his uncle so you get to the very, very end, and we haven't given you these, these choices like this in the narrative because we're telling this one story. And now we're at the end, and it is time to put a period on the sentence. And I wanted to give players a moment where they had to own it. They had to say, yeah, I'm going to actively participate in this story. I'm going to be the ghost. I'm going to reject tradition. My uncle's begging me to kill him. If you care about your uncle, if you love your uncle, you're going to do what he asks. Or you're going to say, I turn my back on all that. It doesn't matter to me anymore. I'm going to leave you alone. And so by giving you that one choice, it's to, it's to bring the transformation solidly home. Is, do you feel like there's a right so answer? What did you choose? Question? Yeah, I want to know what everybody chose. I do. I, so I, I chose to let him live because I feel like at, this, at that point, for me, the way I interpreted uh, Jin, right? Like, I mean, he'd spent all this time essentially backing away from samurai tradition and becoming his own his own person and really seeing the value of hey we don't necessarily have to live by these these stringent ideals like we can um uh essentially act in ways that 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 are going to better us and better our people um despite being against tradition and so for me jen in that moment the way i saw it wouldn't have killed his uncle like for me he would have uh that that was the last step into backing away from that from that samurai tradition. Imran, what did you do? Say his blessing, but my reasoning was exactly what Jin said after. Actually, it was I'm not going to kill my family. Like th hmm. the long and short of that whole journey for me was he doesn't care about tradition or honor. He cares about what the people around him are actually doing and staying alive. For me, it was interesting because when the choice popped up, I thought it was such an easy one. Of like, oh, well, you know, the whole game, whatever is this. And I am the only person I've talked to who killed him. <laughs> 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 it popped up and I'm like, my uncle is a slave to tradition. Like, I'm going to give him this. I'm going to give him this. This is what he wants. I know this is what he wants. This has been, oh, we have no relationship anymore. He wanted to fucking fight me to the death. You know what I mean? Like, this is what he wanted. And I don't agree with it, but like, I got to go my own way anyway. So yeah, I, I sat, I got kneeled right in front of him, took out my little sword, stabbed him, and he thanks me. And I'm like, all right, I did the right thing here. Mission accomplished. <laughs> and you're ending, uh, does he, he, I assume he yells at you, right? And like, you you leave and he's like, ah! I don't know, what is that? He's mostly upset that like, he's like, it will never stop. People are always going to pursue you. And he's like, yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah makes yeah. sense. Nate, what did you pick? What, what To you, what's the your true ending? So the true ending would be Jin leaving his uncle alive and saying, <laughs> I don't care about your rules. I'm past that now. I'm, I'm, I'm something else. I'm the ghost. However, my personal Nate Fox emotional response when I play the game is I kill him every time. <laughs> yeah. The reason why is because I like him. And ironically, liking him means you should kill him. That was that that is another thing I think we didn't talk about in the review, obviously, because it wasn't for spoilers, but I really, really dug the relationship between Jin and his uncle. And it was that, you know, when I was doing the early stuff and I was doing some of the assassination stuff and some of the ghost stuff, I was like, oh, this isn't gonna go over well with my uncle. And sure enough, you know, Khan's like, you know, teasing him that, oh yeah, you know, he's already Jin would never do that, blah, blah, blah. And then when he saw me do some of the assassin stuff, he's like, mm, I don't like that. I'm like, all right, cool. And then we did the terrifying thing, holding up his head. He's like, Gee, Jin, what are you doing? And then like when we actually have the break, like 
I thought it was all, you know, a credit to your cast, so well acted and so well written of, you know, turning around with the adoption papers in his hands and like tossing them into the fire and having this, you know, irreparable damage done and then having to sneak out of your own camp where everybody loves you and seeing your relationship deteriorate with uncle and then getting to fight against uncle at the very end, even though he shows up to help or whatever. It's like, I'm with you that it's that rare thing where in any story, let alone a video game, I feel like we get to that fight and I'm like, I don't agree with how we got here. I clearly don't agree with you on what you're saying, but I still love you. Like I still dig you. Like I know what you're all about and I understand why there's this chasm between us that you can't cross with me. And that's why I will kill you. <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of interesting to me. Like I had not played last of us by the time I played this game, but I had, I had known enough about the game that I knew that the gist of it was don't let revenge consume you and then i started playing this and this game was like fuck yeah revenge like get as much revenge as you possibly can so it was like <laughs> the proximity of these two games coming out where Jin is very much not lauded by society but like lauded by his own inner group for doing what it takes to quell this invasion is on it like it's a bit funny but like really interesting to me about how those two coincide for me, it's uh, it's interesting you call it revenge. I never thought of it that way. For me, it always was we were at war. We were trying to liberate. I'm trying to liberate the island, and it and it is that thing. It reminded me of like when we learn about and uh, you know when uh, I don't even know. Blessing, you're younger than me. I don't even know if they, they even teach American history anymore. But when we would learn about the Revolutionary War, right, and how it was that you know the colonists rebelling or whatever, they just refused to fight in like the single file lines, like the British were fighting, and that's why we were able mm -hmm. to do it, like. That is how I kept trying to explain the story to people that I was like, well, yeah, you know, this island, he, samurais, they know how to fight this very traditional, respectful way. But the Mongols come in and they're not about that. So it's like it literally the, you know, the crux in the very beginning of it are like, do you die by tradition or do you evolve into something that might be a monster as well? And so on that journey, I never was thinking about it as a revenge thing as much as I was thinking about trying to get these people off my land, <laughs> get out I of think my for, country. Yeah. For me, it was like the moment it was revenge was Yuna's side quest. Where the, granted, those were against Japanese people, but like it was specifically when you were kicking those those three brothers and you were taking off their heads. Yeah. I was like, oh, yeah. this is straight up just revenge is great. Yeah, that's that's true. <laughs> That'll give you okay. I, I will say I did I I did as I was playing goes. It, it's it's tough because they're so close in proximity to each other, but I was also having that last conversation in my head too of like oh yeah that game is making such a statement on revenge and on violence in video games in particular and as i was playing through ghosts i was like oh snap this is making i mean definitely there are different observations in in ghosts and there there's a totally different direction as far as what what ghost uh, has to say about violence and about war and about revenge and all these different things um but for me it was like all right what it what is honorable, what's not honorable, and when is it worth it to not be honorable? Which is why I found I found the uncle character so interesting because I, there was no point in the story for the uncle character. Well, let me not say no point. There are very few points in the story with the uncle character where I was like, he's being too harsh. Or where I was like, I don't get where he's coming from. Like, for the most part, I was like, okay, this this guy's making some good points. Like, at what point do we become the monster? Like, at what point, you know, is the... Is, at what point are we stooping down to their level? You know, especially when, when Jin starts to use things like poison uh, right. for, for war and all this stuff. Um, and so I, I found that dynamic super inter interesting. Um, and I found that like, I was pretty satisfied where, with where we got toward the end, where I was expecting toward the end of act one for Jin's uncle to turn on him because the, you did have Jin captured or not Jin, you, you had the uncle captured, um, by the Mongol leader. And, um, I can't remember his name. He's the Khan essentially. Um, Kobe and Khan. He's, Yes. Yeah. Uh, he was he was telling the uncle that like, hey, yeah, your your nephew's out here uh, stabbing our men in their backs and doing all these different things. And he's like, I thought Jin would never do that. Yeah. He was like, Jin would never do that. And I, I was thinking that that clash would happen earlier in the story. And so to see that you get tore, you get past act one and you see them kind of confront it, but then be like, like the uncle's like, all right, you did what you did to save me. But this stops now. Like, we, you know, we're going to fight honorable going forward. And to see that continue and continue. I thought that was very uh, I thought that was very compelling and very satisfying to see um, that like toward the end, that's where we actually like, that's where, that's where lines are drawn and, and they're like, all right, we can't, we can't do this anymore. Yeah. I, I, I was, I was with you, blessed. I was worried that, yeah, it was going to be, 
Khan would tell him that I would show up to save him. And that's when there'd be this big blow up between us in a relationship. Yeah. I already kind of I liked, you know, from the little bit I had seen. So I was happy you didn't do that, Nate. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> when, when we were casting Shimura, the scene that we wrote um, was effectively um, a scene we've all seen before where a father finds like a bag of marijuana in, in the kid's um, drawer. Yeah. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, yes. you, d- yes, you did sorry, a little I weird did thing, and I think your you image might have froze for a second. But... Right now, it looks oh, like no, I'm in the middle so... of an awesome drum solo. Oh, okay, yeah, right, back. Back. <laughs> okay, all right, great. So, it, it, you know that, that moment where a dad's like, what is this? Are you smoking dope? <laughs> I need you to be better than this. You can be better than this. This is not, there's no future in this. You know, and the kid's like, ah, it's no big deal. Uh, of course, for I'm Jin Sakai, uh, no big deal. You know, <laughs> yeah, they all talk like that. But it was, it was, he finds that he had some, some poison that he had been using. And mm. like, it, the, the tone was just a father who's trying to save his son from going down the drain, even though it's not the, he, he wants to redeem his son in the format that he believes is the most important. And Shimura even is a way of talking about the repercussions of doing these sort of things. You know, if you unleash poison and give it out to everybody, that means that the chaos is going to take over the island, that anyone could just put a little bit in somebody else's drink and it's just lawlessness. Yeah. And so it's not, it's, there are reasons for rules in society. Part of that, of course, is just keeping the people in power in power, which is sort of a counter argument. Um, in some ways, the samurai are the, the bad guys of the game, really, because they're trying to defend the status quo in that last third. And Jin is saying, what's more important, the status quo or everyone's freedom? And uh, it, you know, that, that's where the clash comes in. Something I found interesting, and it was something I felt early on, but definitely by the end, I believe. Maybe it's my own interpretation. But you know, we talked about you guys finished uh, Infamous, and you're like, well, we just need to do something that's not Infamous. Even talking about it here with the poison, talking about the character development, talking about becoming the ghost. Did you at any point stop and go, oh, man, we're making another comic book game. We're making we're making a superhero <laughs> game here. Right. Because like, you know, Tam from GameSpot put up the thing today. He's like, this is just a Batman game. And I was like, I love it. And it was him spinning the camera, the cape in the wind. Like it, I, I saw so many pangs of the comic book stuff we've talked about before about infamous here of this storytelling of you know you think you're doing the right thing but that actually makes your villains right and that being with the poison here that you know Jin introduces this but then it starts to get mass produced and it's going to be used all over the place uh you know the battle between him and his father the abilities you do get did i I, as somebody who honestly i think had or not even think knows that i had no affection i also didn't hate or anything but i had no love for samurai genre before this now i do and i want to get a list of stuff from you by the end of the show to go watch or read <laughs> to get to the end of this and have it me be like oh man this was a, a batman story like Jin for me feels like batman is that just a hero's tale to you nate is that something you think you brought over from infamous is that just something that samurai stories are that i didn't know no i don't think that's common to samurai stories uh uh-huh this sort of transformation from samurai to ghost is um, it's not intentionally meant to be a superhero feeling story. It's meant to just be one of transformation. Um, There is this idea of who you are. We knew you wanted to be a samurai first, right? And then, yeah, Who's the ghost? The ghost is somebody who uses fear as a weapon. He's somebody that goes beyond the, the traits and the skills and the moral boundaries that a samurai is. And also is like a larger than life figure to the people of the island, sort of a, a tall tale. Yeah. And that transformation, becoming this larger than life person, is something that I think would happen in the year 1274. If you really slew 300 Mongols, people would think that lightning bolts would shoot out of your eyes, that you could breathe fire, that you're an inhuman monster. And that is how you're meant to feel, right? That the people of the island start thinking of you as 
larger than life. The Mongols, if they see you kill one of their brothers, they fall over and they run because they're so scared of the ghost. It's not really a superhero story, but it is one of you becoming uh, uh, legendary in this very small world of Tsushima Island. Yeah, and I think plus you do I made that all so the well. games, so maybe I just can't help but do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, honestly, one of the my, I think my, the funniest moments in the game is such a throwaway line on I think it's a side quest. If not, it's just you're with a a bunch of dudes running on a mission or whatever, and at some point, one of them puts together that you're the ghost, and he's like. Oh my God, you're the ghost. And, you're, and Jen's like, yeah, some people call me that. And he's like, but you're not 10 feet tall. You're not shooting a fire out of your eyes or whatever. And I was like, oh yeah. my God, I love that, that that little bit of it, right? Speaking of being larger than life, I I would be remiss if I did not ask this. What was up with the Tengu? Was that an actual Tengu or was that a person in a Tengu mask? Because I genuinely do not know. Ah, right. This is the the Demon Longbow mission. Yes. When you you get the bow, it, you are you are meant to be drugged and this is your hallucination. Now, but the thing is, is that everybody on this island believes in these things. So while this is a completely grounded game, from Jin's point of view, that was real. Mm. Okay. Mm. Right? Interesting. Because he's, he's kind of tripping, right? And this dude in the Tingo mask has been haunting him this whole time, right? Threatening him, he looks kind of scary. And then he comes at him while Jin's kind of in this state. And unto Jin, this is a real event, but you know, it's it is a man in a mask. So you you mentioned it was grounded, and like that was one of the things that's as I was playing that game, I kind of like years of samurai video games kind of factored into my head of like I'm kind of waiting for the drop of when the myth mythical aspects of it have like kind of come in. Even though I knew this is not that kind of game, I had just played Neo, I had played other games, I played every other video game about a samurai in my life, and those always have some degree of like yokai or something what at what point did you decide like no we're not doing that for this one this is just a samurai human story from the very beginning we were not going to have any monsters mm -hmm. um, it's just because we wanted to go after that classic samurai movie experience hmm. simple as that so so with this game being a samurai game, what do, what do, what does representation look like as far as like mm -hmm. people working on it? Cuz I know a lot of the cast or if not I mean probably all the cast, you know, are uh like Asian representative, right? Yes. There was there people were there people on like the writing team or on the development team that, you know, were also either Japanese or Asian or uh people that 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 you guys consulted with where you know, that came into play with the samurai aspects of the game? Sure. Uh, well, we definitely wanted to have uh, an all Asian cast for sure. It was as many people of Japanese descent as possible, particularly if they had some cultural knowledge of how to stand or how to kind of uh, interact with one another in a way that would deliver a feeling of authenticity. But to create the feeling of authenticity from day one, all of us at Sucker Punch who were raised inside of an American kind of cultural backdrop, we knew we were just going to fail at that. Absolutely. Mm. So we had to reach out to experts who came in to tell us about religious beliefs at the time, costumes, uh, how people held their swords, how you use their swords, mannerisms. Uh, fortunately, we're members of the PlayStation family. So Japan Studios was super duper helpful to us. They took us on research trips to Tsushima Island and around Japan itself to do things like look at how blacksmithing worked at the time. And they even went so far as to do audio recordings for us for uh, like deer and insects. Having these experts come in early and repeatedly while we're making the game, telling us where we're going wrong, that was key. And without them, we would have uh, not been able to produce the level of authenticity we did. And while you know it's not perfect by any stretch, it's us doing our damnedest to try to do right by people who are very familiar with uh, these period sword drama films so that mm -hmm. when they play the game, they're not kind of tossed out of it by something being off. What, when the idea gets going and you to kick them all around and that gets thrown out there, was there a knee-jerk reaction of maybe we shouldn't try doing that because it is so far from what we know? Because again, like, you know, the last game is in Seattle. You can look out your window for reference material, right? Whereas this one is across the globe in another uh, country, in another hemisphere, like all these different parts to it. Like, 
or was it you wanted that level of challenge from the get-go? You just wanted to play an open world samurai game first and foremost. <laughs> like nobody else has been waiting well. for somebody to make. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think that's how game makers make their choices. What do they want to play? And just one of the hurdles for making this game is like being real upfront about what you don't know, just being honest. And so we went into it with eyes open, knowing that our little community of Sucker Punch was inadequate to doing this. And, you know, I'm, I'm so glad. Like, we'd be down on the mocap, st mocap stage doing a scene, and we had a motion advisor there on every shoot, and we'd be blocking in a scene, and I wouldn't know when she would tap me on the shoulder, but she would all the time and say, uh, that's not how they'd be holding their sake glass. <laughs> She'd show us, show the actors, and then we'd all hold it the way she told us, trying to always do it right. And it's not clear when you're going to go wrong. So you really have to have somebody there with you uh, you know, holding our hand to, to make it feel correct. Did you end up doing a bunch of independent research? And by independent research, I mean watch a bunch of samurai stuff? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely have watched a lot of samurai uh, movies and uh, read a lot of samurai comics. Have you guys ever read the comic Usagi Yojimbo? Mm -hmm. I haven't. Yeah. Is uh, that one I got to so... put? Is that one of the ones? <laughs> oh, I'm open man, up I love Usagi Yojimbo. Um, so the guy who wrote that, Stan Sakai, the name of Jin Sakai is mm. the hat because I love those comics so much. Uh, they are uh, loosely based off uh, my Mata Musashi's kind of wandering. And I started reading them when I was working on dialogue for the Sly Cooper series because Usagi Ojimbo is about anthropomorphized animals, except for they treat each other with the utmost respect. And I just really got into it. So I would recommend that. Okay. That it was definitely like... How did I even get onto that? Sorry, I start talking about Usagi, I get super psyched. <laughs> <laughs> As somebody, I've watched a bunch of samurai TV shows and stuff like Us Usagi Ojimbo and like uh, Tezuka's old manga and stuff like that. And it, this game definitely seemed inspired by that in the sense of the episodic side quest of like you go somewhere, there's a title card, and you like you do the thing yeah. like, a, like a lone wolf and cub where they would just kind of wander into a town solve the thing and then they just go on to the next town so was that totally. all a direct inspiration <laughs> um absolutely i was just looking at my, oh yeah see like, i just have it right by my no yeah like oh. it, it, without question it's it's perfect right the wandering mm -hmm. samurai goes into towns there's always some trouble brewing and they they take care of business it's it's very friendly to an open world format. Right. Shout out to all these being on Comixology Unlimited too. We're not sponsored, but hey, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> Ten bucks. I can watch, read all this stuff. That's great. Putting it all on my list here, my cart. Um it, so in that vein, then, is that how you looked at your side quests? Like when you you know, like you said, from basically your day two, right? You have the sentence of what's gonna happen and what this journey is. You can see the arc for Jin there. Is it then how, yeah, you want to pull from something like Lone Wolf and Cub, like Imran's talking about, for your side quest that you come in and it's going to be this contained thing for the most part, unless it's one of the obviously character tales that's going on with like Sensei or whatever. But the other ways around it is you wanted it to be just this, here's this episode, here's like a, a taste of what's happening on the island. Absolutely. Um, I like to think of the game uh, like a tree. So you've got Jin's transformation story, which is like the trunk. Then there are these branches that come off of it, which are the... the the tales that you've, of the characters you meet along the way, Lady Masako, Sensei Shikawa. And then there are other branches that come off of that that are their own stories. And it's meant to be an anthology of stories in the game. It's not really just Jin's story. Jin's story is a, a fractionally small part of it. We built the game with the idea that there would be other things going on and that that would actually be the more important thing for you to deal with so that players would find themselves just going off over the hill and getting lost in Tsushima. I think it works. <laughs> it's funny you guys ah, mentioned good. like being paranoid of the uncle before, because I was I was paranoid of everybody else that they were going to betray me at some point. So when Masako did betray me, oh, I was yeah. like, I knew it. I knew it. I knew it was gonna happen. Then they got over it real quick. But like the entire time with Ishikawa, I was like, what is his deal? What is he not telling me? Yeah. And it, it turned out he just didn't tell me things because he's a cranky old man. <laughs> <laughs> 
So yeah, were think... there? Oh, go go. Were for there it. were there other open world games that you guys looked to as inspiration for how you're going to structure this one? Because I know for me, when I as I as I was playing through, I was like, man, I'm getting feels of like Breath of the Wild. I know Imran was referencing like Witcher a lot and um, Assassin's Creed a lot. And like, were there games that you guys were like, all right, these are these these are what we see as you know the the quintessential open world games or the open world games that we love that we we took after right so the the two games that i'd say are most impactful when we started uh the game red red excuse me red dead redemption did in my opinion just a magnificent job letting players into the boots of an outlaw cowboy it felt like a cowboy simulator the costumes marston's story the environments the music it put you there in that environment. And I felt like it wasn't just about his, his story, but there were a lot of stories to find all around the Old West. Mm -hmm. So early on when I'd be pitching people and trying to get them excited about the game, I'd just say, look, we're making Red Dead Samurai. And then instantly people would get it. They would say, oh yeah, all right, I get it. I'm gonna be a samurai and we're gonna reproduce the feel of feudal Japan. Oh, let's make it. So that was absolutely a cornerstone for us and making this game. The next one is totally Breath of the Wild. This idea that the landscape has an incredible character and mystery to it. And uh, there's a feeling of personal agency of just saying, I'm going to ignore what this game might be telling me to do. I'm going to do what I want to do. And the game will reward you for that. Um, another game that I think does this really well is Skyrim. Mm -hmm. um, I couldn't even tell you what the main plot of Skyrim is because I <laughs> constantly get lost in all of the things to do. And I love the game for it. It's amazing. That's why our game is meant to be an anthology of stories, not just jamming down Jin's transformation arc. Yeah, I think, you know, I, people who want a golden path that I think lose a lot for that, right? Like, oh, I think that totally. for even I, you know, I, I think uh, I was reading a subreddit thread that I maybe I haven't been representing myself as well as I thought I was in some of it. But like, even for us where when it came time for me, like, oh man, the review's coming up. I need to turn on the jets and actually make sure I'm playing the thing. Like it didn't lose something for me, but I loved so much that first week with the game where I was like, I'm just going to do everything or anything and, you know, ride in one direction and think I'm going to where I, this question mark over here, but then, you know, uh, uh, the bird passes and I'm like, oh wait, where's this isn't going the same direction. I'll follow that to something brand new that I didn't know was over here. Yeah, Totally. Do you guys ever go on vacation to uh, a city, you know, before quarantine that you don't know <laughs> and you don't have a plan? You just start walking because uh, yeah. you're in like Rome or something and you're like, ah, I think I'll have a, a coffee. And you go into a coffee and you come out and you see something down the way and you just you just go where your feet take you. Yeah, I find that to be the most fun. Like It is that it is real world video games for me. And I think in Ghost of Tsushima. When you have the experience that you just described, Greg, where the bird takes you over here and then you see a, a column of steam from a hot spring and then, but on the way, somebody's yelling out for help and you just kind of pinball from one thing to another. That's, that's where the game's at its best yeah. because it's solidly just your, your choices. Is that where the, the diegetic stuff came from as far as, you know, with the wind pointing you to your waypoint, the birds, you know, guiding you to something cool or like the fox the fox dens, you know, the fox is leading you to to the shrines and all these different things that appear in the world naturally as opposed to like just through, let's say, like a mini map or something like that. You've totally nailed it. Uh, we had all the kind of standard UI when we started the game, but I found like when you're riding towards the dot in the middle of your UI and it's just counting down the meters till you get there, you're not really looking at the world at all. You're not present in the moment. Yep. But when we turn that mm -hmm. stuff off and you just kind of know the overall direction, suddenly you're looking and you start noticing stuff around you. And then we can use those diegetic elements like a column of smoke telling you that uh, the Mongols are burning something. It, it, it just makes the world suddenly something for you to discover and participate in instead of just min-maxing your passage through space. I got, I got a controversial question for you. Yes. What? Why, 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 why is there no lock on in the game? Oh, like here during, we go. During oh, here we go. <laughs> like, this is one of, one of my few big complaints with the game is that there is not a lock on. It doesn't like it, at the start of the game, I found it to be more of a problem than it became like an hour in the game. Like, at, at a certain point, I got very used to it and I was like, okay, you know what? This is not as bad as I thought it was at the beginning. Um, but was there a specific reason why you guys decided, hey, let's not, let's not go for a lock on? 
So in looking at classic samurai films, it's very frequently one guy against a big group, unless it's a duel. And when he's fighting a big group, he's moving from one enemy to another, to another dancing between their blades. And that was the feeling we wanted to get, especially since your enemies are the Mongols, which are known for large numbers. So we very purposely did not do a lock on so that players would get into a rhythm of attacking this guy and then bouncing to this guy and then dodging this guy and then going back in so that you were, had awareness of all of them uh, in trying to defeat the group. Makes sense. In duels, Makes sense. we do lock on to the enemy because there's only one person and we know you really want to square up on them and uh, yeah. see their every move. But when mm -hmm. it's a group, we wanted you to have situational awareness. So you kind of mentioned why like why Tsushima for this one because it was about the Mongol invasion. In was there ever any thought of like was someone ever going like hey what about Tokyo what about Kyoto like mm -hmm. other places and not to commit you to anything in the future but it's like would there ever be th any thought about going to those places in the future? Oh, you know, right now uh, we are just completely preoccupied with getting Ghost of Tsushima patched up as much as possible based on some of the feedback we've got from uh, some re reviewers or just our own QA testers since the game went out for production. So we're, that's what we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. I, I would be very excited to make more samurai uh, adventures in the future, but I, there's nothing right now that I could just say, yes. <laughs> but if you had a personal choice, like where would you want one to be? <laughs> Well, we gotta go. Is, uh, we gotta go to Kyoto at some point, right? Uh, who from the game was gonna go there? We I did a bunch of side quests, right? And I saw Yuna someone wanted to go to Kyoto. It was Yuna, right? No, somebody wanted to go somewhere else and start something. This she is wanted to get off the island. Was it? Um, uh, was it Tomo? Did Tomo want to go? Was she going Kyoto and she might start some business? I thought she was somebody who wanted to go somewhere and start a business in Kyoto. Kenji. Oh, Kenji. Kenji's, Kenji's with me forever, all right? Kenji's my boy forever. Don't try to take him away from me. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Sorry. I, I totally so, sidetracked I, the conversation. There, I, I don't know where we would go next. Yeah, no, I, I look forward to the challenge, I'll tell you that. How... Can oh, sorry. How, how do you... How do you... This is always a question I like asking developers, Nate. You've worked on this game for years. It's finally reviewed and then literally as of us recording this it comes out tomorrow right like how yeah. do you then deal with us immediately going can we have more <laughs> like <laughs> there's a question in the comments from uh uh kuchoko who's like can what is there any plans for dlc are you just like oh, i just finished this please let me it's not even finished we're working on it like is that heartwarming that we want more immediately <laughs> or is it completely frustrating that we're not happy that we already have what we have oh i could not be happier that people are interested in more uh, okay Without question, I mean, we, we've been working on this game for so long and it is, it is a little tiring as you might imagine. But the last thing I would want is for somebody to get it and be like, and that's enough. I mean, that would, <laughs> that's a heartbreaker. Um, right here, I'm gonna insert a word from our sponsor. Nice. Are you gonna use you a like British that? accent? Do you want me to do the ad in a British accent? Yes. No, All right, Kevin, stop. remind me. No, no, Kevin, I, remind I, me no. at the end of this. I got it, uh, Kevin. When we record these at the end and then insert them I'm right here, I got to do it in a British accent. So, ladies and gentlemen, here is here is the ad with a British accent. This episode of the Kind of Funny Games Cast is brought to you by ExpressVPN. Have you ever watched The Office? Of course, you have. But you probably also know it's based on a UK show called The Office. That's right. But what if I told you there are nine other countries with their own versions of The Office that you've never seen? Well, you probably didn't know about them because they're not usually available in your country. But you can access content across the world with no geo restrictions when you use ExpressVPN. See, ExpressVPN lets you control where you want sites to think you're located. You can choose from nearly 100 different countries, giving you access to content that isn't available in your region. If you like watching shows or movies, ExpressVPN is a must-have. For less than $7 a month, ExpressVPN lets you access thousands of new shows and movies on Netflix, Amazon Prime, Disney+, and tons of other streaming services. It's a no-brainer. And it couldn't be easier. Just fire up ExpressVPN's app on your computer or TV, select a location, 
application and then hit connect. ExpressVPN is also incredibly fast and doesn't slow down my connection. You know that, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I, what We've been using it for a while now. Cool Greg was using it. I believe Kevin is using it. They're both streaming different cartoons from different places. Let me get my dog. Oh, come on, Porton. Ah, got him. Uh, so... Get the most out of your streaming services today at expressvpn.com slash kind of funny. If you use our link, you'll get an extra three months of ExpressVPN for free. Again, that expressvpn.com slash kind of funny expressvpn.com slash kind of funny to learn more. Our other sponsor, well, it's Purple Mattresses. Technology has improved just about everything. Phones, cars, shopping, yet mattresses have more or less been the same since the invention of sleep but we deserve better. And finally, the mattress has evolved thanks to Purple. The secret to Purple is the Purple Grid. It's a patented comfort technology that instantly adapts to your body's natural shape and sleep style. Purple is for everybody, no matter how you sleep. Purple is designed with over 2,800 open air channels and naturally temperature neutral gel. You'll never sleep too hot or cold. The Purple mattress is soft where you want it, firm where you need it, and comfortably cool all over. It's truly a mattress that does it all. Uh, we know for a fact how good Purple is because the one and only Tim Gettys, that's right, Forbes 30 under 30 winner, has been using the Purple pillow and he swears by it. He won't shut up about how good it is, how it's always the right temperature, and how he loves it. You can count on resting easy night after night, year after year, because the ultra-durable Purple Grid won't sink or lose shape. Purple is so confident in what they do that every Purple mattress comes with free shipping and returns and a risk-free 100-night trial. Experience the next evolution of sleep. Go to purple.com slash kind of funny and use the promo code kind of funny for a limited time. You'll get $150 off any purple mattress order of $1,500 or more. That's purple.com slash kind of funny promo code kind of funny for $150 off a mattress order of $1,500 or more terms apply. He's a good boy. I don't know if I can keep it up. There's a lot. Of, there's two ads, Nate. I don't know if I can do <laughs> my terrible British accent for that long. Oh, but the sponsors I'll try. are gonna like that. <laughs> it's also a very good point. Um, so speaking speaking of uh, uh, DLC, actually, not to interrupt you, Greg. I, I apologize. Please um, go for it. But so, like toward Act, I think it was toward Act Three. So like during Act Two, toward the end, um, when I think this is like when Jin was either in prison or th- there was a certain point where I was like, Jin's not gonna make it out. And the the buck is gonna get passed on to Yuna, and Yuna is gonna be the main character. I also thought game. that. Really? Yeah, legit. Yeah. I was like, yeah, legit. I was like, oh, Yuna's gonna become the Ghost of Shima. I was convinced at a certain point uh, until it didn't happen. Um, <laughs> but that did make me think of uh, DLC and future games, and and you know, possibly playing as other characters. Is that something that you guys ever thought of, uh, or like something that 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 came up, like the idea of switching characters, or even like what might a future game be like uh, without Jin? Well, we're just not at a point where we're working on a future game right now. But I, I mean, I definitely think of Yuna as being another ghost, for sure. In the game, she and Jin are partners, and she's as capable, and she's right there with them. So it's not crazy at all that you thought that. I mean, we definitely wanted it to feel like she is, is just right there with us. Her, his sword because mm. she's the one that he trusts with it um, mm. and she could use it if he's not coming back so it's i don't think it's a crazy thought at all but um as for you know like details i don't have any no no yeah yeah i have a question in a similar vein in terms of things that wouldn't have made it right we're talking earlier we were talking about fighting so we're talking about fighting in a group we're talking about obviously calling it for a standoff uh the one-on-one duels were there other things, I, I think it's interesting because, you know, when we watched that state of play and had all this dropped on us and you're seeing it all, you're like, oh, my gosh, there's so there's all these different mechanics and uh, ways you're fighting. Were there ones that you were doing earlier on that either got cut for content or didn't weren't as much fun or were there other things like that or were these the core the whole way through? This was the core the whole way through. Uh, we knew that a katana based combat was like the absolute dead center of the experience. When you think about being a samurai, you think about getting in sword fights. So we started early and we never stopped working on that. And it, it, it took a fair amount of work, animation, to get it to where it was. Other aspects of it, like duels or standoffs, are kind of satellites to that 
base experience of just being surrounded by enemies with your sword out and having to dance between their swords. And a similar question, talk to me a little bit about uh, things in the open world. Like, you know, we've talked a lot about it. Uh, you know, uh, me and Imran have the platinum because we're really good gamers. Blessing too young, doesn't understand how to hold a controller hey, in a platinum exactly. game. Exactly. I mean, uh, but one of the things that I, we, I was talking right. about, right? So you, you have the armor then. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, the uh, uh, iridescent, what, uh, what's it? It's like, yeah, you, okay. you know, the colors. It's all super colorful and cool. Um, yeah. I will tell you that that was the very last thing we added into the game because. Yeah. We, we just didn't, we didn't feel like we rewarded people enough with platinum. Sure. And so we scrambled huh. to make this armor uh, die variant just so we could say thank you for getting to this point. Uh, hopefully it is loud enough and uh, <laughs> vibrant enough to warrant all of your hard work, guys. I remember getting the platinum in Second Son, and then Delson saying, "Like, hey, we spent too much time together." So I'm glad in this one, like, the game actually kind of thanks me for getting the platinum. <laughs> You're like, "Oh, good, I don't feel bad about this." See, the platinum, you know, the platinum itself is the reward. I, I didn't, I didn't need the armor. I appreciate it. I thank you for it. But you know, my real, my my real memories, or what the real treasure was, the memories I made along the way. Like, you don't have to worry about that. You know, I get the end there. Um, but the question for you was. Uh, when you're doing all the open world stuff and we're talking about, you know, bamboo strikes, we're talking about uh, the hot tubs, we're talking about the fox dens. Were there other ones of those that you tried that didn't make it? Do you, I mean, I, I know one of the things that I, I've talked about, you know, is like at the end trying to platinum it when it is just like, OK, I've done all the missions. It was like, all right, 40 some fox dens, you know, and I still have 15 left or whatever. Were, were there other things you wanted to put in there that didn't put come uh, it didn't work or didn't come together? Um. Not really. I, those those little kind of collectible mini games. I mean, mm -hmm. they're not even really mini games. They're so small. Those are meant to just accent the the feeling of the time and place to give you these moments to either drink in nature or just focus on what is it to do a sweet sword slash. And it, it's just about that. Um, I love them, and uh, I certainly with you know, another year of development would have made a lot more, but we didn't just have some kind of waiting around that we didn't use. Sure. That makes sense. I, one of the things I do want to do too is uh, I want to compliment you on the Fox Den that we show up to and it's been like ravaged. There's like a dead fox there. Like I thought that was a nice way after it because it happened deep enough where I was in the rhythm of getting them and I'm like, all right, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to chase a little guy over there yeah. or whatever. And it was, I, I appreciated that one shaking it up. I appreciated that, you know, the Fox dens would also intersect with like standoffs or fights or whatever, where it was like, it wasn't just chasing this Fox every time there were things that shook it up somewhere along the line. Uh, one question I want to get in here too before we uh, get into anything else, and or, you know, a whole bunch of different stuff still happening here. But we talked about obviously uh, at the beginning of this. You want to do a samurai game. You want to do something completely different, and then also obviously you want to make it as authentic as possible, as respectful as possible. You bring in all these you know uh, representatives, both from Sony Japan and just experts and all that stuff. All that said, and all the work that went into doing this game correctly and not having it be, you know, hit and be hollow or hit and just be completely off the mark, does that make the Famitsu review all this all the better? I mean, you know, it's here we are. You, you have this perfect score from them, right? It's like you're the third Western game, right, to earn a perfect score from Famitsu, like. That's incredible, right? Because I mean, Famitsu is video game <laughs> reviewing in Japan, right? How? Uh, what was that like? Uh, when I learned about that, I just I felt relieved. Uh, we wanted so much to just do right by Japanese gamers and to not make something that would kick them out of the fantasy and to get told, "You did it, guys! You." You put in the homework. It, yeah. it felt great. But, you know, I just didn't want to screw it up, man. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah, that would have been a problem. It's not just, <laughs> I shouldn't say I don't want to screw it up. I mean, the whole team doesn't want to screw it up. We worked hard to, to look at as everything we could, you know, architecture, how boats were made, all that stuff. And I shouldn't say it, it's, it was hard. It was actually one of the great joys of making the game. We've never made anything like this where every day you're learning. Mm. Uh, people came to Sucker Punch because they were excited about working on uh, a game set in feudal Japan. So 
you get in there and now it's your job to figure out how to uh, model the Sasha Mono banner. People were psyched to do it because they were interested in the, the time. Uh, they've come up by name, but talk to me a little bit about the cast of characters here that were like Jin's team. Like, I think I was caught off guard by how much I liked uh, Sensei Ishikawa, uh, Lady Masako. I, her entire storyline I thought was fantastic. We talked a, a second ago about having to fight her. I, I did not expect to have to fight her. And when we did have to fight her, it was another one similar for me with Uncle, where I'm like, this sucks, this sucks, I like you, but don't make me... And so that at the end, when you beat her, and, and, and she's like, don't try to kill me again. She's like, I won't. I'm like, I love this relationship. <laughs> I love that that's how it ends. I'm like, don't try to betray me again. You got it. Let's go do this. Like, where do they enter the picture in terms of, obviously, you know, you're making an open world game. You know you have the main quest of Jin stuff here. How do you start coming up with those characters then that are going to accent this story? So we knew the the trunk of the tree was that transformation of Jin from samurai to ghost. And all of the other characters are just satellites around that. So the two easy examples there are Shimura exists in the story to say, you are screwing up, Jin. You have to stay to the course. Yuna exists in the story to say, I'm going to challenge uh, the status quo. You should do what actually helps the people of the island. So you can see how those two are pushing and pulling on him. Now, Lady Masako is the embodiment of just fury and revenge. Mm -hmm. She's going out there and she, we, internally, we call her murder grandma. Because <laughs> she just, <laughs> she just is out for blood. And you can see, it's like a cautionary tale. Should Jin just let Fury uh, take him, he will be like her. Ishikawa has a relationship with Tomoe, which is very similar to Jin's relationship with his uncle. So you're seeing a mirror of what could happen to Jin with his uncle through the lens of Ishikawa and Tomoe that uh, hopefully lets you think about a future with Jin differently. All of the characters are just there for that reason. Speaking of Tomoe, is... So I feel like this may be a thing you'll tell me is up to my interpretation, but was she actually like captured by the Mongols and forced to work for them, or was she doing it voluntarily? She was captured. Okay. Actually, I'm actually really glad there's an answer to that. Because <laughs> I spent that <laughs> time like being suspicious of both of them, and I figured like at some point they would make me choose. I'm like, I didn't want to choose. Because it's got to be one of them's right, and not both of them. But Good to know. Sure. Shout out to Lady Mosco. Some of my favorite um, uh, screenshots that I've taken in the photo mode in the game. We got to talk about photo mode also. But, you know, I've, I've, I've been trying to do some, like, character portrait screenshots. And I have, like, up-close ones of Lady Mosco with, like, her sword, um, like, obviously ready to kill. Um, you know, that I love that. I haven't posted yet because the game hasn't come out. And I don't want to, like, spill, do, like, character spoilers for anybody. Um, but, you know, Nate, for you, do you have a favorite character in the game? Ooh. Uh, my favorite is Uncle Shimura. Uh, mm -hmm. I just love that guy. Um, he, uh, I want to please him. That's why I kill him at the end because I like him <laughs> yeah. so much. He's yeah. my favorite. He's the uh, samurai ideal that I know I'm not to measure up to. <laughs> Can, can you talk about the the photo mode a bit? Because I know for me and for quite a few other people who I've seen like tweeting about it and talking about it, like. I'm absolutely in love with the photo mode. It's probably my favorite photo mode in a game. Um, and I, I think I think a, a big part of that is the fact that you guys have the animated environment thing where you, when you when you pause for the photo mode, the grass is still flowing, the wind's still going, and the particles are still are still going. What was the thought process into putting together this photo mode? Uh, just to take advantage of the beauty of Tsushima. I mean, so much effort has gone into creating that dynamic world and the particles that go along with it. So why not let players participate in that act of creation? And I think that's brilliant. I think that, you know, yeah. I mean, for photo modes in general, I'm always a fan, but like, so some of them are, I don't want to say bare bones, but some of them are as simple as just like, all right, cool. Your color and contrast is the character there. Or are they not there? I think the, you know, not even just the fact that they can be animated in this. It's the fact that you can, change them you can go through and cycle what particle you want you can you know make it from nothing to all it's crazy in there yeah. the you know different filters dropping color taking color the rolls the text day. like yeah exactly like yeah whether like all like all the options are there I, I feel like are super good uh, in terms of of creating your own scene 
um and like the world itself is just a a is it's very visually stunning in a way that like every few minutes in the game i'd want to pause to get into photo mode yeah uh and so like i actually for you let's talk about i want to talk about that actually because the environment in the game is probably my other like favorite thing about ghost tsushima um how visually diverse it is and varied and colorful and vibrant what inspired you guys to go that direction with it well i give full props to uh jason connell who directed all of that and i think he is a genius he he and i are both huge fans of samurai cinema and he correctly kind of eyeballed how spartan things were and how clean they were and so he uh i can, i'll never forget because the thing that really made it clear for me was the team was going to make a fern forest and he had a picture of what a real fern forest is. It would have a fern with a tree and maybe a, like a bush with like some brown coming off of it. And that's what photorealistic forest is. And then he had another picture, which was just fern. That's all it was. And it's not as realistic because there's not the diversity that you would see in real life. But uh -huh. it's such a strong, powerful statement about just this is a place with visual identity through a very steady uh, color that almost becomes a landmark in the, in the space. And as you move from a huge clump of ferns to a big, a rich bamboo forest, which is bamboo, right? It's not ferns plus bamboo. You get a strong sense of variation and also like core identity. And that Spartanness is what makes the environment so alive to me. And, uh, you know, the Sucker Bunch art team, I, I don't know how they do it, to be honest. I'm not a member of that team. <laughs> I wish I was as good as them. They're the best. Yeah, I think that, I mean, that's the thing, obviously, since State of Play, I think, when we guys really got to give a giant presentation of this game and have it go out there, it was shown there, but then to live it, you know, for 50 some hours, maybe 60, I don't even know. Uh, I think the game is so visually stunning and i love the style the game uh exudes right like i feel it's to your point that i think you know you're in these things and it's like these colors are otherworldly but they also are completely fitting for the island and what they're doing in a way that i'm right there with everybody even if i wasn't taking the photo that the amount of times i would stop on a cliff's edge or ride into a new thing and just look take it in or you know back to the very beginning of this show talking about your journey with your horse and who Jin is and how he non-verbally communicate stuff you know riding through the flowers and seeing him dip his hand just to like you know pet the tops of him as he goes I was like oh my god like there's a world here right and it's like you guys created this thing and everything fits inside of it if that makes sense while we're talking about the art team and other weird things uh finish the game you know this is again the first time we get to talk about any stuff it's super exciting you finish the game you're in Jin's house his his, his little uh, ghost bat cave or whatever you want to call it and you're looking through all his you know his memories right and going through everything from the journey you just did i also noticed a bunch of origami pieces that seemed yes. uh, a little different can you explain that if people haven't <laughs> seen these because it, it's very easy to miss so those are uh very small shout outs to other uh, Sony game development studios. You pick them up and look at them and they are different elements from other games that are made by our sister studios. That's awesome. I, That's really I love cool. the little Easter eggs. I love that it's held to the end because obviously in the middle of it, if I would have picked up uh, Ratchet's face, I would have been like, what, what the hell is this? <laughs> but like at the end, as I'm like, it, it's this weird juxtaposition for me because it's the this awesome thing of all these little Sony Easter eggs that I think you can blow right past. And then also Jin going through and picking up like the straw hat, right. And remembering, uh, uh, Rizu, right. We haven't Rio even talked about Rio. Yeah. Like we haven't even talked oh, about yeah. like that journey and what that relationship and friendship was like, like then to have these little things there as a nod to us, the player, as we've, you know, if you want it to be, you're at the end of your journey, or if you want to be, you know, a real cool gamer, like me and him run, go get the platinum. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Not be a coward. One day I'm gonna get it. I sure I will. really did. I I didn't know about the origami thing until you brought it up just now, and I really thought you were about to be like, "Oh yeah," and you, there's this Easter egg for Paper Mario and the Origami King in there. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "Oh crap!" So like, like, I looked at it at first. I was like, "I wonder if this is an infamous Second Son reference because of the paper stuff in that game." And I was like, "Oh, oh yeah, wait, yeah, yeah. now I actually recognize the shapes of it. I can tell what this is." 
It's like it was a cool moment for that. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Do we want to bring up any of the other stuff? I know uh, blessing you wanted to talk about at one point uh, the death of Taka, right? Like, I mean, hit him. Oh, picking yeah. up his sword, right? And this like brutal thing where I was like, "Don't do it! Don't do it! Don't do it!" And then he grabs it. Even Jin's looking at him like, "Don't do it!" And he turns around, and tries to get the con, gets knocked. Well, out. I was I was pissed off at him because I'm like, "You don't know what the fuck you're doing. Just like run away and get help. Get go get <laughs> Yuna. That will help much more than what you're doing right now." <laughs> Yeah, there. I, I I was actually surprised by the amount of like fates and the amount of I guess character journeys in the main story that I found myself um uh like super engaged with that I di- I didn't realize I was engaged with until they had those moments like the talk the talk moment we we're talking about yeah. um but also um uh what's his name we just mentioned him Ryogu or something like that uh, Ryuzo. Yes, yes. Like when when you get into the duel with him you know when you're in, when you're infiltrating um the the castle in, in act one um legit i i got chills like when that face-off happened yeah. uh, legit the whole time like hey. as you're building up the duel, duel i was like no please no no and then when you get into the duel and i'm like i guess we're doing this bro i guess this is happening well for me it was like yeah when he didn't show up right when him and the straw hats didn't show up i didn't jump to oh they're betraying us i was like oh they're gonna come in at the last second and save the day like they're mm-hmm. running late they got whatever they're still coming and then to get there and have them be, have flipped, I was like, holy shit. Yeah. And then to have that throughout the way. And I thought his story was so well done. Again, back to my personal push that this is a superhero game, right? Like <laughs> a villain created by uh, uh, Jin doing what he thinks is right with just living his life, right? He he is a samurai. He wanted to become a samurai too. So he had to win that duel, right? Whereas he's like, no, you didn't. You could, <laughs> that was my one chance and you fucked me over. You were going to be fine regardless. You could have taken the L and it's like, oh, that's a really interesting chip to have on your shoulder for that long and see where that journey led him. And now it blowing up in our face about it. And so, yeah, I'm so glad you guys are paying attention to those <laughs> conversations when they're just riding on horses. Oh yeah. Uh, you're picking it all up. I mean, that's the, that's the history. And certainly when we're making the game, uh, we wanted to show people doing noble actions and doing selfish actions. And when people fall down like that, it's for a good reason, right? Trying to stay alive in this really crummy situation. I did like how Ryoko like, kind of, he didn't want to seem to fight Jin because he knew he would lose. And like the time you do fight him, he's kind of resigned to it and be like, well, I guess we're doing this. Maybe I'll have a shot. Maybe not. But like every time you, you see him talking to Koten Khan before then, he's saying like, yeah, nobody can beat him. I don't know what you think you're doing, but just sending <laughs> swordsmen out after him is not going to work. Yeah. Did, do you know that scene where um, Koten Khan is kind of uh, mentally dominating Ryuzo and he makes Ryuzo burn some peasants alive to intimidate the people in yeah. Castle Shimura. To me, that is one of the uh, the best moments with Ryuzo because even though he just betrayed you, you suddenly feel sympathy for him because he made a bad choice and now he's suffering it, having to do horrible things because he made his bed and he has to sleep in it. It, it to me, that it really uh, changed my feelings about him because he wasn't, I felt a lot of sympathy for him, I guess. Mm-hmm. It had flipped it around. Yeah, the way he does it and then collapses, you know what I mean? Like when he doesn't yeah. have to do it again, like you, I'm right there with you. And again, it's in the same vein as Uncle where I like you. I understand why you're like this and where we are and how we got here. You know what I mean? It's not like you're, you did this and twirled your evil mustache. You did this because of what you thought you had to do to survive and what you had yeah. to do for the straw hats, right? Because he's doing it for them. They're yeah. starving. They have no food. That that's that was my big thing throughout the story is that and f- aside from the Mongols, pretty much everybody is is doing what they're doing because they see either the good in it or the value in it. And so like you know when it came when it came to him, uh, you know burning the bodies in, in front of the castle right to intimidate them, it was it was when he he started breaking down and being like just please just open the door. That's when I was like okay I I'm I'm feeling this sympathy uh, uh, sympathy now. Like I I understand where you're coming from even though you know what you did was pretty objectively evil like you're doing it because you're not you're not seeing another way forward you don't you don't necessarily have hope that Jin's gonna be able to take back the island i was on the same side until yeah. like Jin kept giving him chances to like join us and he kept going now nah, i'm good like I, I just, well, i'm already <laughs> too far it's like no really you're losing just back off for a minute you'll be fine 
Yeah. And that kind of also it kind of also adds to the cons uh like how intimidating he is. Cause for me, when I when we do that first storm on the castle to take him out, and like he ends up throwing Jin Jin over the the bridge into the water, I think that set him up as a very uh kind of a scary villain. Legit, I was like, oh snap, this guy seems like he's gonna be a force to reckon with. Um, so like the the build up throughout the game of him, like continually, continually like, I guess thwarting his power and continually like you know establishing that he is the con, he is here to uh to to fuck shit up um i i mean i thought i thought the game did a pretty good job with that and yeah toward the end the, the satisfaction of having that face off with him and, and uh, um having having that that uh uh wave based kind of combat uh like boss battle at the end of it yeah uh felt satisfying man we i i failed you uh the running joke with uh patrick the guy who played the con uh i feel like maybe eight times in the story he tries to convince the people of Japan of, of Tsushima, be it uh, Uncle Shimura or Jin on that bridge before he throws him off. He's constantly mm. trying to get the people of Tsushima to surrender so he doesn't have to hurt anyone else. He's going to intimidate them, but he wants them to throw down their arms so there will be no more bloodshed. And He's being very scary is, about uh, it, though. Very... <laughs> oh, no, no, for sure. I mean, he's going, he will, he will destroy you. But part of why he wants to intimidate you is so that you'll just stop. To me, that is what I, I, I really like about him is that he's sort of um, unnervingly uh, logical in what he's saying. And I don't think it's much of a stretch to say that everybody would have been better off if you know, they just laid down their arms. So many more people would be alive. Of course, Sushi would now be part of the Mongol Empire, so that's its own problem. But uh, I feel like he's got a pretty reasonable argument. That's crazy talk. He's an invader. Get off my island. <laughs> you know what I, I mean? mean? <laughs> you show like early, like the very first scene with him is him like just burning uh, Adachi with a, like a torch. It's like okay, that's that's not I think a good person does. <laughs> I mean, but no, like Jin, yeah. poison poison folks. Like yeah. Jin did a lot. He of had to. He was backed into a corner. Blessing. Well, so it, it was became, the con. It becomes that thing of like every game for like 10 years, the final boss would say, we're not so different, you and I. I'm yeah. very glad they didn't actually say that in this game. Oh, like, no. It was implied, but it was good the line didn't actually come out. <laughs> we learned this from you, the poison. <laughs> it all goes back to you, Jen. You're the mistake. You're yeah. the problem. <laughs> well, I mean, like from a narrative perspective, the fact that Jin always felt like he was a loaded gun where someone's like has their finger on the trigger the entire time. Like to the point where mechanics of that game feel like that, like the standoff specifically. Yeah. That uh, as it kept going through the narrative, I'm like, okay, y'all are just standing in front of a loaded gun at this point. This is kind of on you. Yeah, the where standoff thing was interesting for me because I think, yeah, in the beginning, I, I was doing it doing them fine, but like somewhere by the end of act one. The, I, and I, I would be interested to know if there is a gameplay mechanic in your head, Nate, for this. But it was that at some point, if the fact of you hold a triangle and release triangle to do the move somewhere between it, it stopped feeling active to me, and more passive as if there was this like wall of force that I was barely holding back. And then I'm given the second to unleash it. It didn't feel like I was doing it as much as I was getting out of its way. Like I was pulling the cork out of a champagne bottle and letting gin explode. Oh, yeah, totally. I think that, I mean, that, that's the intention. Um, for all of our other attacks, you know, you hit the button and the thing happens. Yeah. But for that one, you press the button and then you're waiting. And you, I mean, there's like an actual physical tension on your finger while you're doing it. Yeah. I mean, I know it's not a big deal, but you are holding down the button. And you're waiting to release, release the sword out of its sheath, release the button. And it's, it's, it's tense, right? The camera is pulling back while it's getting narrower, so it feels like you're getting a little bit of vertigo. Uh, the guy moves a little bit, and you don't want to take the bait. And then he really moves, and you have to do it. You have to move your hand back, as Jin does the same thing with his arm, to try mm. and make you as sympathetic to the exact moment of what Jin's doing. Yeah, early on in the game, I was like, oh, this is easy. I'm going to be able to do this for everybody. Like, why even bother to fight them? I'll just stand them all off. <laughs> then by the third act, I was like, I'm not going to stand anybody off anymore. It's really hard. I'm just going to kill them from a distance with like a with poison or something and not have to actually like deal with that. 
Yeah, the amount of times I screwed it up, like into Act Two and Three, I was like, "Oh God!" I'm, I'm, I'm like, it's, it's totally, it's back to what we're talking about. I'm just like, I'm not the ghost of Tsushima. I'm just a guy who can barely do this standoff right. And then when you, because when you nail it, you nail it. You feel so powerful. I think that that mechanic is probably the most uh, quintessential samurai thing in the game. Mm-hmm. I mean that that just dead silent tension, waiting for yeah. the other guy to move, and then one slash. I uh, I love that. I tried to finish people off in duels with the, uh, what was the name? The Heavenly Blow. Just because I, I like the idea of like the slash past the samurai and then watching them slowly fall. Just because oh, yeah. that is the oh, samurai thing. Oh, it's so good. Totally. You did, they, they're dead on their feet. Yeah. Yep. 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 Oh, yep. man. I love it. Uh, Nate, one thing I'd be remiss if I didn't ask. Was there ever an idea to put a quick change like loadout? thing in the game for gear and charms this is something we were talking about right of like we were all so obsessed with the game that if i'm riding on the horse i'm wearing the traveling garb and then i'd get to a place and it's like oh i'm gonna switch over uh to the sh- the sakai armor so i can get a better standoff and like yeah. we're, you're hopping into a menu and switching your gear let alone charms i didn't really touch until the very very end of the game was there ever an idea to do something about that no i had never heard that idea until watching your review and I got to say, it's a really good idea. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome to take it. Put it in a patch. I don't mind. You don't have to call it. You don't, have, you don't even have to put my name on it. It's fine. I won't be offended. You know? I do want my name on it, though. Damn it. All right. Fine. It's in my <laughs> patch, then. Uh, Nate, is there anything we haven't talked to you about that you is like your first chance to talk on a camera? I think about like what's actually happened in this game. Is there something that you want to ask us? Is there a, a topic we didn't touch on? Anything like that? A story we need to know? Yeah, actually, I'm curious. You'd ask me who my favorite character was. Who are, who are your favorite characters and why? Interesting. Interesting. I mean, I I think it's a cop-out, but I love Jin. So I'm going to put that out there, that I, I totally love Jin. I liked filling in, you know, what I, I it's a game at the end where, you know, I, like you're talking about, I think a lot of people are, I think even Blessing, who had to go get something, is, ta- is uh, you know, talking about how stoic he was and how he didn't really connect with him. And for me, I think, again, projecting so much superhero Batman coal on him, you know what I mean, of getting to the end and having those moments with uh, Nobu for me, uncle, you know what I mean, these things to see him grow and fe- feel and have pain. I really dug him. And, like, you know, that's why, like, as soon as a PlayStation or no Funko put out the, hey, here's a limited edition Funko pop of him, I bought it like a sucker, <laughs> like the sucker I am. I'm like, I love this guy. I'm buying his pop. But outside of him, I think, uh, and it's a weird one because I do love uh, Lady Masako. I did love Sensei. But Kenji got introduced and I was like, this guy is like the annoying comic relief. I'm going to hate him. <laughs> and I ate up his journey and his side stuff. And by the time when it, you have that conversation with him of like, why are you just fleecing people? You could do so much more. And he has that thing of like, all right, I will. And it's like, holy shit, that's awesome. I just inspired this guy. And like, we saw him go from just the, Hey, I'm going to steal all the sake and steal their stuff and sell them ping pong ball parts or whatever. He's like, no, no, I got this. And I was like, Oh my God, Joe Pesci very fast in your impression. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, I'm Kenji. You know what I mean? (laughs) Who was your favorite? For me, it was, I think Masako was probably the, the one for me just because like, when you see her, you see her as like, you mentioned her as murder grandma, but like you her can tell that awesome. even, even at like her, you know, like sixties, she is as good as Jin. And so you have to imagine when she was younger, she was probably a like she was the ghost of Tsushima of that time. And I love the idea that you can see her start to it's like she has almost like no growth during her side quest. It is her mostly being on revenge. And then suddenly we realize like, yeah, I don't need to maybe kill everyone, just most people. But the scene with the uh, former housekeeper, the former maid, where you find mm. out her and Musco used to be lovers. It's like, oh, that actually gives a lot more depth to her character all of a sudden of now I realize she's not just a murder machine. She had a life. She had a husband. She had a family. And at times she got bored with these things and she ended up falling in love with a woman. And the part where she tries to explain to Jin, like, we were very close. And Jin's like, I don't need to hear it. I, It's fine. Whatever. Just you do you. I think that that is good emblematic of their their relationship where they, they've bonded over this shared revenge. And the second she starts getting to be more of a human, Jin's like, I'm aware of it, but th- that's your life and you've lived a long one. And I think it's you, you follow your star. That's all I had to say. Yeah, I loved that. I loved her quest line because it was for me too. Like, you, it kept me guessing because I was re- really like, all right. So did I? At one point, I was like, 
So her husband must have survived, right? It's some it, like you're talking about how you know it sounds like very personal story and how this thing. So then to actually get there and be surprised at the ending and have it make sense and like have the love interest I liked. Um, we haven't talked at all. I mean, shout out to Yuriko, right? Like, mm-hmm. uh, like I yeah. thought she and she's awesome in general. Of you know, she's helpful grandma, not murder grandma. And uh, you yeah. know, but then to also see her not only uh you know r- ravaged by dementia but like also wrestling with what you're asking her to do and her being like again not that i'm dri- trying to drive the batman thing home this much but like the <laughs> alfred who's like along for the ride of like all right if this is what you need me to do uh jen i will but you know going through that seeing it having her start to slip more and more and lose time and, and you know start to think jen is his father and what that actually that relationship was and the explanations there i was like oh this is great too like just getting to hang out with these characters. And I think that's what you you do so well, right, on these side quests is not only are you there, yeah, for the killing and the gameplay and the whatever, it, there are is so much just hanging out. You know, let's make a haiku together. Let's do these things that I think in another game you I would not roll my eyes at but not be invested in. Whereas, like, for every one of the haikus, it was like, what are we reflecting on? All right, what should I look around at? Oh, I don't like that line. Oh, I like that line. And start trying to actually piece it together to make something. What? Real quick question: What was the grandma's? Well, not the grandma, but like the the what the nanny? Here we go. Yeah, yeah you're, what, you're what go. was her relationship with his dad? Was there? They were. They were lovers, right? Okay. Okay, I thought yeah, that. I didn't know if I was being crazy. Because it, it, man, it creeped me out no. when she was like, there was some, like when she was like, <laughs> oh, you're you're, you know, mistaking him with her father, his father, and like. Things getting a little weird, and it's like I don't like this. I don't like you're like a grandma figure. So like, stop this. For a second there, I was starting to think like, wait, is she about to say that she's Jin's real mom? <laughs> like, wait, is that is that where this is all building to? But no, it just builds to, yeah, they they were lovers, right? And like, uh, how I love that. I love. I mean, it's heartbreaking, but I love her story of like spending the night with you, taking care of sick Jin was the happiest I've ever been. Does that make me a bad person? Right. When she's completely lost in the moment with Jin thinking it's the father, like Mm -hmm. that was so heartbreaking, but also like so powerful. I thought Mm -hmm. also, I didn't get a chance to say this earlier, Nate, but like, how could you break my heart the way you did with Sora? You know, like there's, there's, (laughs) there was no reason to do that. The, the amount of times we were riding and he would say, or Jin would say, like, oh, after all this, we're just going to go on a peaceful, like, ride. And I'd be like, yeah, we are. It's going to be great. And we never got a chance to. Yeah. <laughs> War as hell. What do you <laughs> <laughs> If you so, would have just given up to the Mongols, it would have been fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did we, did we talk about, like, the, the moment Khan where... asked you to surrender seven times. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good point. He did ask us to surrender a lot um did we have we talked about the the moments where uh you'll do an assassination and then that'll trigger like a story moment of like you know a flashback to uh jen talking to his uncle and like mm. his uncle teaching him the same right way because those are some of the coolest moments for me as i was playing the game yeah those flashbacks are dope uh that, that yeah, was like, one thing that uh, i mean i think it's was a bit of a challenge to try and explain uh, the code of the samurai to people because we didn't really want to be like a textbook. We wanted to personalize it. And so how did Jin learn about these rules from his uncle and how does he get haunted by them even though he doesn't stop, right? So he jumps down, he smashes a guy uh, from above, kills him. And there's that moment of saying, I got to do it. And so Mm -hmm. I'm a fan of those because in an open world setting, those play completely dynamically. They're based exclusively on what you do as the player. And so it's, it's you making these choices in time. And then you get that little narrative hit from the uncle kind of repeating his warning. So it's still in you. You know that what Jin is doing makes him feel a little cringy, but he's not going to stop. You can't. Uh, a blessing, while you stepped away, the question was asked from Nate who our favorite character was who was your favorite character oh oh favorite character um man that's difficult and like so i was one of the people that mainlined the game uh because toward uh toward the path of reviewing this game i thought that i was not making good time because i i during act one i was doing all the side stuff and i was clearing out uh um that portion of the island and i got to act two and i looked at how long i'd been playing the game and i was like shoot i got a mainline ended up 
beating the game, you know, w- like quite a few days before the review. And so like then I went back and started doing more of the side stuff, but I haven't gotten to do all the tales that I've wanted to. Um, and so like right now, I really like Lady Moscow. I, mm. I, I, I mean, one, just because she is this murder machine. Murder grandma. Um, <laughs> murder grandma. Yeah. And I, and I love her for that. Um, but I also do really like the uncle. And so like shout out, shout out, shout out to the uncle. Shout out to um, uh, shout out to the con. I'm just getting shout outs now. Yeah, now point. you're just listing everybody in the game. You're like looking at the <laughs> yeah, IMDb. Like, you're still down the list. <laughs> yeah. Um, Big fan of Norio. I, like, I haven't I haven't gotten to do any of his stuff yet. Like, I, oh, I'm, dude, uh, you got to. The, the, yeah, I think the line is gruesome. Yeah, the character side quests I think are just so well done because they are. Yeah, what we're talking about earlier, right? The lone wolf and cub. Like, here's an episode, right? Of you're just doing something in town. These longer ones that are pieced together tell such interesting stories. And uh, see, yeah, Norio's entire journey, yeah, and him go from one very specific place to a completely different place by the end. Is like, holy shit! Yeah, I didn't see that coming. I really liked uh, Kenji also. Like, I thought that was a very good, uh, like, comedic character uh, that mm-hmm. like added level lev- levity th- uh, throughout. Um, and also shout out to Yuna. Like I really like Yuna as a character. I think she she does a good job of uh like like you said, Nate, like adding that that opposite perspective of of the uncle and kind of pushing you forward and pushing you on your journey. Um so I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick Yuna to I'm, right? I'm gonna I, say I, Yuna I like is the my entire cast. <laughs> <laughs> Actually speaking of Uncle Shimura, like so I was trying to piece together through flashbacks and through like the main story. He seemed like he was a good uncle slash father to Jin. I could not tell if he was a good lord to Tsushima. Because there was the thing with the Yarakawa Rebellion, which seemed yeah. to imply that... So they said it was like, oh, one of them got drunk and decided to cause a big riot. It's like, but when you actually go to Yarakawa, they seemed like they were actually very pissed about the whole thing and did not think Shimura treated them well. Yeah, they, they hate Clan Sakai and they hate Clan Shimura. They were, in their eyes, oppressed by them. So yeah, in the history is that uh, Jin's father Kazumasa and Lord Shimura uh, just dominated them and uh, slew all their samurai and made them second class. So he's not a perfect person at all. Mm-hmm. And those sins that he had done, Jin has to kind of work through in the game to to win back the Yarkawans who inherently don't trust him and think that he's just a pawn. you know not everyone's <laughs> perfect yeah no and i like that about it i, I, I like that in i like that with every character you know, you know I, mean, I like that uh for uh sensei ishikawa right like it was very much that he starts off and he is any i mean by the end he is too still like very pompous and sure of himself and yada yada, yada but he let there are he lets his humanity come through at times right and he does question himself and if he did the right thing and if this is it what 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 has his, have his actions led to? And then even to get to getting back with uh, Tomo, right? And not having it be like we, they, they don't fight to the death, right? They are this thing and they do have this moment, even if it is from a boat to a shore, like you have a moment with them of like, all right, cool. This is what it is. Like, I like that the game it doesn't exist in a, a black and white scenario of like, this is good and that's bad. Even like you're talking about Nate, that, you know, in some ways, maybe the con was actually, you know, offering the olive branch, even though the Mongols are just there to kill everything nonstop. The only morally good person in the game is the the tell, the guy who tells you the tales that gets you to pay the items. <laughs> the musician or whatever? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Anybody got anything else? Any other pressing questions? Blessing, are you satiated? And I... I think I am satiated. <laughs> I feel like I'm a ghost, you know? Oh, you are the ghost? Yeah, maybe you should I go am platinum the ghost. tonight, you know? I mean, maybe you know not I mean? tonight, because I, I have a lot to do still. There's, oh, that's, a, there's a, that's a big world with a lot of things to do in it. And so mainlining yeah. it and coming back to it, it just left me with a lot of tasks. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a question for you two guys that platinumed it. Yeah, um, all right. Why? How, how did you decide to take on side quests. Now, I've told you that my hope for players is that they they ignore the trunk of the tree. They don't just do Jin's tales one after another, that they go off and they do the, the uh, friend character chains, or they just find other things. What, what got you to kind of go off that main path and explore? We kind of talked about this a little with like the Breath of the Wild comparisons, but the way I played Breath of the Wild was I had a heading, and I just do whatever it was on the way to the heading. I'll get distracted by whatever I want. 
this kind of it kind of the same way for me is like for example with the six duels quest i saw the duels on the map and i was like that's far away i'm gonna have to like dedicate some time to going there so i do that and just like as i did that i would do other stuff on the way so like for the most part that worked out like with character quests i look at the number first and a lot of variety mm -hmm. like i i just want to know like if i'm not going to do five main missions in a row i want to do some variety of this i want to do everyone get everyone on the same number before i move on which is just ocd a little bit but i for the most part it was i wanted to travel tsushima and do things as they came about naturally yeah for me it was similar because for me it was clearing the maps right where it was you know i wanted to obviously yeah get to whatever the mission was but i put on the traveler gear and start going and see the fog of where li war lift and it would be a question marks over there or you know, white smoke or something would stop me or you know it would be too of like stopping and fighting bandits or mongols and then getting whoever you're saving they say something interesting and i do want to go do that like it was that sense of the world's my oyster where do i want to take it how do i want to do and to your point i think nate from way back uh, talking about this game and comparing it to infamous and that how infamous of course is like a jungle jam and there's a million things this one having it spaced out was more of a, a for me uh, the idea of looking at the map and be like all right cool even if i'm going just you know do north and there's the mission i want to do but I look over here and the fog is clear and there's just two question marks and they're pretty close together. I would, you know, go uh, east, right? And I would go and do those to knock them out to then move to the next thing. And I just kept organically going that way. And, you know, my hope had been that I would be able to do everything and then platinum it with beating the final mission. Because I feel like that's, again, to your trunk of the tree argument, like I wanted all the branches extended, but then to make review embargo and everything, I, I ended up deviating from that and coming back and then just cleaning up what I needed to clean up and run around and do that. But it okay, cool. So if it wasn't for the review deadline, you just would have gone wide. Of course. Yeah. And I think that's the best way to do Solid. it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Cause I think it is that so much uh, attention in detail went into those character side quests that even like it was that thing for me of like, and I'm a weird completionist slash uh, story guy. So even when we got there and like, it's like, okay, we're about to do the final attack. Talk to your friends if you want. It's optional. I'm like, well, I'm going to talk to my friends. And walking up to each one of them and being to like Lady Mosque, I'm like, thank you for being here. I know we still haven't caught your killer. I'm like, oh, fuck. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> God damn it. I wish we were here saying, I know we've caught your killer. And now we're going to go do this. Yeah. Thank you for everything. I was like, ah, fuck. Like, that's how I felt. I felt connected to those characters. I, I wanted to take care of those characters. I thought it was interesting that, you know, I don't know how right but uh, uh norio like when he got introduced i didn't realize he was one of the like the you know starring side characters that he'd have his own quest and so i'd already done a bunch of everybody else's and then he popped up and i was kind of like oh like you're kind of a johnny come lately i don't really get who you are and I, you know i ran off and did a whole bunch of other stuff and i think even pushed it to act three and then started doing his stuff and i was like fuck even you are awesome and i really wish i would have started this earlier and really gotten you where you needed to be because, yeah, by the end of that, finishing all those off and having it, this team that you like this weird Ocean's Eleven Avenger squad you've assembled that you've all gone through some shit with. Right. It reminds me so much of Mass Effect 2 and like having those missions, those loyalty missions to get Jacob and Jack and make them fucking your people. That is the nicest compliment I've ever heard. <laughs> Mass Effect 2 is the greatest game that's ever been made by human beings. <laughs> Sub Legend of Zelda. <laughs> <laughs> I, I kept wishing. uh God, what was her? I don't remember her name. The the boss lady of Imuragi Cove. Like I kept wishing she had more stuff because I was hoping she'd like oh started Lady Sanjo. Like, lady Sanjo because she seemed cool and I wanted to like get to know her better. But it's just that one quest. Yeah, yeah. She's. I wish we'd given her more time. All right, I have another question for you guys, and this is me trying to learn how to make video games better. <laughs> sure. <laughs> when you got the ghost stance. Mm. Uh -huh. and you can decapitate a leader and power it up or you can kill you know a certain number of dudes and the mongols or straw hats in your area will become kind of fretful because you you've been slaying their pals yeah. did you get that ghost stance meter up through stealth or through just straight up fighting guys for stealth. me it would, it would be stealth yeah uh, for me it was fighting guys because i basically by that point in the game i had a build that was sent around terrifying enemies so it was just very easy to when I'd kill one, like we would fall to the ground, just immediately just go stab them. Then if you're wearing the ghost outfit, it becomes very easy to just yeah. after like four or five enemies, just be in ghost or ghost dance. So I was basically 
terrifying people. It was just a roulette of people terrifying people and then ghost stands, then terrifying more people until entire camps were decimated. Yeah, once I got the ghost armor, that was what I was wearing, right? Because again, at that point, like I, I think it's such a credit to the story and what you were trying to do, right? That we got to this point that Jin's like, no, I am the ghost of Tsushima, right? And I was like, I am the ghost of Tsushima. <laughs> and I got that armor and I wore that armor and I'm like, now the gloves are off. I'm going to stealth everything. I'm going to Sly Cooper on these wires and jump down on people and do everything and use the poison and use the hallucinogens. And so just by... I think nature of playing that game that way, the ghost stance was being filled in by stealth. And then it would be the, all right, there's just a few people go out there, you know, assassinate one, show myself, ghost stance, kill all of them. And then like, you, I'm thinking of it when I'm taking down the larger Mongol encampments, right? Of then move to the next section to get the next uh, hostage free or whatever it would be. Yeah, and I know for me in the way that I, I played the game, uh, especially toward the end, I'd use stealth as kind of the setup for me then entering uh, like the samurai, like actual actual face to face fighting combat. Um, and so like a lot of times I would take out, let's say, like the first five Mongols or straw hats through stealth. And then that would then transition into me, uh, you know, going ham and then throwing kunai and doing all this stuff and actually like entering combat. And naturally, I like, through that I would then end up having ghost dance and that like if I if I hadn't eliminated everybody by then, then there'd be like very few people left for me to just like take out. <laughs> question Nate. i, I think yeah. i think imran and i might have talked about this or maybe it was me and bless but there was a thing of how how does the game decide when we can do a standoff and when we can't there were times where i'd be right. riding at a bunch of enemies and i'm like all right hold tr up up on the d-pad and they would all start looking at me and i'm like oh go 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 and then, they, then i would just be fighting them normally man uh i wish i had made that clear uh it it is when you're approaching a group of Mongols, we invisibly make a perimeter around them. So every roadblock or war camp, uh, the code looks at where all the enemies are and then makes uh, kind of a line that says, this is where they've held this position and you're over here. So as they get close to that perimeter, it's like Jin is approaching them from a distance and they haven't um, you know, drawn swords yet. So they don't know necessarily that he's a threatening person, that he's as powerful as the ghost. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, you have the option if you're outside of that perimeter. Okay. The, the meta is just supposed to be when you're approaching Mongols and they haven't drawn on you yet, you can call them out and say, send Challenge out me. Yeah, fight me. And they don't know what they're up against yet. These fools don't know that they're facing the ghost. And so they'll come out and get you. Sounds yeah. like you guys every now and then uh, hit a snag where you didn't get it, which sucks. <laughs> I mean, uh, I thought I think fighting in general is fun in your game, so it wasn't that bad. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't like, oh, this is ruining the experience. I was just like, what am I missing? Why can I do it sometimes and not other times? Greg, Greg brought up this. How often uh, were you tempted? How often was I attempting? I would say pretty much any time I, I came up on people on the in the road. Yeah, that would definitely be the thing. The road if I was came the up kind of like I mostly just yeah. didn't get it. Yeah. Were you ever in stealth and you would see it kind of flash and you'd be like, Ugh, uh, oh yeah, yes. totally, a couple times. Yeah, and, and the same thing with like challenge remaining enemies and stuff. I was like, I could, oh, but yeah. I've come so far stealthing everybody. <laughs> like, I'm kind of committed to being the ghost here. I don't feel like screaming at this point, kind of detrimental to everything I've done. That, that had screwed me over a couple of times, not like by, by my own fault, was I would challenge remaining enemies because I could see them just standing upstairs in a room. And like, yeah. I could take these two guys on. And then like a guy with an, like a bow and arrow like across the way started yeah. shooting at me and like, shit i did not see him this is a problem yeah yeah totally i, I did that too of like oh there's only a couple guys left and like six come down as early in the game like oh no <laughs> so greg brought up the sly cooper uh thing like a few minutes ago talking about how you would sly cooper stealth uh your way through and we got a question on pswxoxo uh earlier this week about like do we see dna of other sucker punch games within this game and so like nate for you were there were there is there dna of like Sly Cooper and or Infamous and or and most importantly uh, Rocket Robot on Wheels in this game. <laughs> yes. So Rocket Robot on Wheels featured a parabola showing you where you would throw a thing and where it would land. That's Rocket Robot on Wheels. There it is. Wow. Sly Cooper <laughs> featured. Um, Look, you're right. <laughs> a good deal of platforming. Oh my god. And uh, you know the feel of sly where you hit the button and there's this immediate speed of what's going on there's there's air steering even in this game which is you know a platform uh mechanic that happens to exist in our very realistic game 
That is Sly Cooper. Uh, actually, the code that was used to make Sly's tail, we still use that for simulation. Um, and then Infamous, of course, is an open world game where we kind of set up how we would make going from one thing to another with mission starts that would uh, exist and pop up and go down. I mean, we just keep building off what we know. Um, and, and there you go. <laughs> That's really cool. The parabola thing is actually blowing my mind a little bit right now. <laughs> well, I mean, I it's pretty standard that. in video games at this <laughs> yeah. point, right? Like, uh, but it's this, it is the same thing we've been doing for a while because it works. Yeah. Well, this works too, Nate. Congratulations. I, I'm a huge fan of this game. I, I'm, I'm, thank you guys for taking the time to play it, talk about it, and then talk to me as well. It's been a real pleasure. Well, you're welcome back anytime. Don't worry about it. Thank you. Thank everybody up there except Andrew Goldfarb. Tell him he did nothing. Just yeah, dude, know. I will. I will insult him to his face for you. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen. This, of course, has been the kind of funny games cast. Remember, each and every week we come together to talk about the things we love going on in video games. If you love that, head over to Patreon.com/slash Kind of Funny Games, where you can get the show ad free. You can submit your questions. You can usually get a post show. Uh, I'm not going to make Nate sit around even longer talking to us in a post show, so don't worry about that. Uh, yeah, and that's it, right? You can get a, if you don't want to spend any money, YouTube.com/slash Kind of Funny Games. Come on over subscribe share it with your friends uh, get it on podcast services around the globe and until next time no it's been our pleasure to serve you <laughs>